Would you please join me in the prayer printed in our bulletin? O oh Lord, take full possession of our hearts. Raise there your throne and command there as you do in heaven. Being created by you, let us live for you. Being created for you, let us always live for your glory. Being redeemed by you, let us give to you what is yours. And let our spirits cling to you alone, for your name's sake. Amen. Okay, the big announcement today is we've got the annual meeting after church. So uh, please be there or be square. It'll be up here in the sanctuary, but uh, we're having coffee hour, so you can grab coffee down uh, downstairs. I don't know if we're allowed to bring coffee into the sanctuary. I think Jesus is okay with it. Is it? Okay. <laughs> Well, there, it's the word of God says coffee in the sanctuary is okay. But, but I don't know. There might be some objections to that. Um, I should say welcome. I mean, what a great day and what a great opportunity to come and uh, worship together here uh, in this uh, church that's been sitting here for quick. How long has it been? 180 years or something, right? A uh, long time. And uh, we're studying a fee... Or a, uh, First Thessalonians in uh, adult Sunday school, and uh, it just has, it's just resonating with me because we're like the Thessalonians, you know, we're just sitting here in our little community doing our thing, and uh, I want to encourage you, as Paul encouraged the Thessalonians, to uh, stay true to the faith and keep at it. This is, we're, we're a, you know, a, a club kind of. Uh, but we're sanctified, we're set apart by God. So uh, I want to encourage you to uh, keep that in mind. Okay, so for the announcements, uh, the annual meeting is, is uh, we already talked about that, uh, talked about my adult Sunday school. Uh, if you have any, uh, any inclination to come join us, we'd, we'd love for you to join us. We just started First Thessalonians, and we today we covered... Chapter 1, verse 1. So you can catch up. <laughs> uh, men's Bible study. You see all these times. Uh, Lucas is encouraging all of us to join one of these groups. Um, any other, oh, I guess Emily Shaw will be here next Sunday. Uh, she's been rehearsing and rehearsing. Right? No, she's not here. Um, any other announcements? So I mentioned this in the Thursday email, uh, but the family of Glenn Horton contacted me. He turns 93 on February 1st, and they're hoping to get at least 93 cards or letters sent to Glenn, and so I encourage you to do so. Um, his address is 148 Irwin Street, 148 Irwin Street, and that's in Brooklyn, Michigan. 49230, maybe one of you online on Facebook right now can put that in the, for everyone else, but that's 148, 148 Irwin Street, like Steve Irwin, Brooklyn, Michigan, 49230. So uh, Glenn is a longtime member of this church and knows more about this church than probably all of us combined. So uh, he loves this church. It'd be great to send him a card. I definitely encourage you to do that this week. Okay, we are turning now to our responsive reading. It's number 664 in the Red Hymnal. This is a beautiful responsive reading. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you 
that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. We will now be singing... Um, Two, uh, two hymns that are unbroken by any scripture reading. I'm sorry, I'm trying to make jokes here. Uh, <laughs> the two hymns, please stand uh, and join us in unbroken praise and you are my king.
Okay, are there any children? I saw a couple out there. There's Caleb. No, I thought you were Caleb today. I'm Caleb, yes, I'm Caleb. He's at Sawyer. Yeah. Okay. Did any of you guys, uh, when you were little, like a little kid, did any of you have a security blanket or like something that you always walked around with? Yes. Yeah, did you? Two things. My grandson, see, he's not here, but this is his security blanket. And he really, really likes this blanket. So he sleeps with it. And when he's feeling like sad or whatever, he wants to have his security blanket. So you had one, Caleb? I have a blanket. I have two. Oh, so, so you had a blanket? Anybody else? Did you ever have any? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, so are you guys, do you still sleep with it and stuff? Yes. Sometimes? I don't know where mine went. Both of them. Your mom threw it out, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember I had a security blanket. By the way, did you know right about now, is when you start remembering for your whole life. Like, you start remembering. So I can remember back when I had a security blanket and it really gave me a lot of comfort. And so, um, but my mom threw it out. It got very raggedy like that. And, um, you know, you will put your teddy bear or whatever in the cupboard. And then sometimes we think like adults, like, we're smarter than little kids because, oh, I don't need a security blanket anymore. But the funny thing is, is that we have our little security blankets too. And for some of us, it's money. And for other people, it's like lots of friends on Facebook or some people really think that they get a lot of security by having power or making themselves really pretty. And so that's where adults sometimes get their security. Now, who knows where this message is going? Pray, that's a good guess. Good guess. Do um, you know what the Bible says about security blankets? No? The Bible says the Lord is my refuge. Refuge, that's a big word we don't use very often in conversation. Does anybody know what it means? Refuge. Refuge? No? No. Refuge means a place where you can go to be safe. A place where you can go to be safe. And that's kind of like a security blanket. You feel safe. You feel secure with your security blanket. And so the Bible says that our real security blanket one that never gets old and tattered and throws away is the Lord. That's a big concept because you can't see the Lord and you know you can't touch it like a security blanket. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it is a really, really great security blanket. So I want all you guys to uh, know the Bible, okay? Know the Bible and know that God is our security blanket, okay? Okay, let's pray. God, we thank you for these children, and we thank you that you are our security blanket, uh, so much more reliable than little things that we might hold on to here on earth. So we place our trust and our security in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hand down to Children's Church. Well, as we go to prayer this morning, I want to say um, if my cadence sounds off, if my speech sounds slurred, I've not been drinking. Yesterday, you know how they say you do two things at one time, like chew gum and do something else? I apparently can't because I was chewing gum and I chomped my tongue so hard. It was so painful and bleeding. It still hurts today. And it's causing me to speak a little differently. So I might have to be slower today. 
but the sermon's shorter, so it's okay. It'll, it'll <laughs> even out, all right? Well, as we go to prayer this morning, um, we have two prayer requests come in already. I mean, you're, there's already some on the back of your bulletins. Uh, Alex Stemmy threw out his back, and that's why they're not here today. They're watching online, so hello, Stemmy family. So we want to be praying for Alex. He's had, he's had a back problems for a while, and uh, so this is kind of a, a real downer for them. So we'll pray for their family. Pray for Amanda got, and the kids. they got to do a lot more with Alex sitting there as the general, just saying, here's what you need to do, people. So, uh, And staying with their family, uh, Abby uh, Stubbins, so this would be Tony and Susan's daughter, she came down with COVID, so that's why they're not here today, and they gave me permission to share that. So um, so we want to be praying for Abby. Sounds like she's doing all right, but tested positive, and is through the, sounds like the fever and ache part of, of COVID. So uh, we want to lift up Abby and, and all those folks, um, the Stubbins family as well. How else can we be praying this morning? What do you have on your hearts? Ruth. It's still a little early, right? But, yes. All right. So probably expecting it sometime in the NICU, probably? Or not sure yet. We'll see. Don't know. Yeah. So you said that's Thursday? Well, probably the first is Wednesday. Wednesday and Thursday. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, very good. Very good. Yes? Uh, this is a phrase we prayed for my dad last week, who for the first time in 87 years put on a hospital gown. And oh, wow. <laughs> I know. Very healthy. Came home Wednesday with the best diagnosis ever. Eat less chocolate. <laughs> Your diet. <laughs> he got carried away over Christmas. Okay. The consequence, and so I'm just really um, not only a praise, but hoping this situation helps bring him closer yeah. to God. Would you remind me your dad's name? Neville. Neville. Yes, that's. I want to say six. So, all right. How else can we pray this morning? And if you are uh, on Facebook right now watching, you have a prayer request, feel free to put that in the comments. We'll see it later. Or if it's uh, more private, you want to please message me and we would be happy to pray for you. Any other prayer requests this morning? Well, let's join together in prayer. Father, this is a wonderful part of our worship service when, you know, we've been singing to you. And we have been reading your word and we've been talking about you, but different to just take a moment to stop and just, we come with you to speak to you in person as your people here at Somerset. Father, we thank you so much for the unity that you bring us through your word and through your spirit. And we pray that would be on display today as we gather together for our annual meeting. We're so thankful, for, I'm thankful for all the people who do so much work here um, that this really is a congregational church and that the work is done by all of us. And so we look forward to what is planned and we give thanks for all that has happened uh, in 2020. Father, we want to lift up to you our leaders. We're thank- I'm thankful for the deacons and the trustees and all the work that they do. And I pray for them as they give their reports and as we talk about it the direction we're going to be heading. Would you guide us and unify us by your spirit again? We looked up Ned and Marlene McGrady to you. We're thankful for their, uh, the work that you have called them to, not only in the past, to be missionaries to people in all, or all parts of the world, especially South America, but now they're using that experience to bless and help give experience to these newer, younger missionaries. And so we pray for them as they have all sorts of Zoom meetings, and we pray that they might even be able to travel uh, in the upcoming months and years to continue the good work of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to our entire world. Father, we pray for Beverly. We're thankful. I'm sure she's watching right now, and we thank you. Thank you for her, and we ask you bless her with a, a good season of health. We pray for all those who are suffering with COVID, and we think especially of uh, Abby, as uh, we're thankful that she is doing well, and we pray that she continue to do so. Um, Father, we pray for Alex, and we pray that the what he did to his back, that it would not be major or serious, that he would be able to rebound from, from this. Father, we lift up to you 
Katie, we're very excited for um, what we hope is a healthy birth this Wednesday or Thursday when she is induced. Um, and we just pray for that your hand will be on her and the baby and that this will lead to a, just a healthy, beautiful baby. And we, Father, we're thankful for the, the good word that Diane shared with her about her dad, Neville, that he is home. And we pray for a good season of health as well. And we're thankful that you had your hand on him. We pray this would bring him closer to you. This time, Father, we, as a congregation, bring to you whatever other prayer requests that are on our hearts, <coughs> words of thanksgiving and praise, even words of confession. So hear now the prayers of Father, as we come to your word this morning, give us a heart that recognizes this as your word, not as just something that uh, ancients wrote down to tell us about God, but this is, some, this is from you, that this is given to humanity that we might understand you, might understand ourselves. So Father, help us to give it the due respect that it deserves, and because of that, may our ears and hearts be open to hear from you what you have for us today. Because your word still speaks today. Your spirit still guides us as we listen and pray. So we ask that you would do that to your, for your glory and for our sanctification. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to whom all glory is due and deserved. Amen. Well, as we continue with our worship, we do so now by the giving of our tithes and offering. Um, I'll have my ushers please come forward to receive that. If you're online and you would like to give, if you go to our website, somersetchurch.com, there is a giving tab there, and you can use PayPal or a credit card to give that way as well. Or you can always send a check in to the church as well. So, ushers, thank you.
This morning's scripture comes from Nehemiah chapter 2, part of chapter 2, and then the beginning of chapter 3. This is Nehemiah speaking, starting in verse 11 of chapter 2. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal wall, well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, <clears throat> examining the wall. Finally I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing uh, to the Jews or to the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. <clears throat> they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Skipping ahead to chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Eliashib, the high priest and his fellow priests, went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated and as far as the tower of Hanel. The men of, Jer of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshulam, son of Barakai, the son of Meshezabal, made repairs, and uh, next to him, Zadok, son of Bana, also made repairs. The next section was uh, repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. This is God's word for us this morning. Now, if we continued on in chapter 3, it would go through all the different gates and all who built it. So uh, I want to give you a little sampling, but it gets kind of repetitive. And I can only go so long faking that I know how to pronounce these names, you know, so. Now, it would have been really easy for me to skip this chapter. In fact, when I originally planned out the series, I wasn't planning on preaching anything about chapter 3. But as I was doing my studying this week, God impressed on me some great things from the end of chapter 2 and chapter 3 that I think should go hand in hand with our annual meeting today. Because it's all about leadership and teamwork among God's people to accomplish God's goals. And that's no different here today in Somerset Congregational Church than it was 2,500 years ago or so in Nehemiah's day. So let's remind ourselves of Nehemiah's day. What's the context here? Well, Nehemiah was a Jew. He was living still outside of Judea and Jerusalem. He was living in Persia. He was living in Susa, which is the capital of Persia, and he was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. While there, well, he lives there, so he got a report from some of his brothers in Jerusalem who lived there, and they came up to Susa, and he heard a report that the city was in disrepair, specifically the walls and gates, and that Jerusalem was simply a disgrace among the people. And of course, Nehemiah responds with heartbreak. He weeps and prays and fasts for several days. And while he is praying and fasting, Nehemiah discerns a plan from God that he should go to King Artaxerxes and seek his favor on behalf of the people. But he doesn't do this right away. He's waiting for God's timing, and, it, and God's timing took four months until he felt the Lord was leading him to go and speak to the king. And thankfully, the king was favorable for, to, uh, towards Nehemiah for him to go to Jerusalem and lead the people in the repairs. And even gave 
the lumber towards a project from his own royal force. So through the first two chapters, we learn five things about Nehemiah that make him a godly leader. He was emotionally in sync with God. He was on the same page as God. The things that break the heart of God broke the heart of Nehemiah. Second, he was a man of prayerful action. Lots of us are men of action or women of action, but Nehemiah was prayerful action. He would go to prayer before just jumping in and doing something. And he, was a, he had a biblical awareness. He was informed by the scriptures. He knew God's word. And because of that, he was emotionally in sync with God and a man of prayerful action. But also because of that, it created a humble confidence in him. Because he knew who he was in light of God, it humbled him. And because he knew who God was according to his word, it gave him confidence that the true God was his God and that what he was doing was God's will. And fifth, he was strategic. And so he came up with a plan. Last week, we looked at part one of that plan, which was to go to the king and get the king's favor. Today, we're looking at the second part of the plan. And that is where we begin in the second half of chapter two in Nehemiah. So Nehemiah begins to implement the second half of the plan. He does so by going to Jerusalem. He arrives there and goes on this secret reconnaissance mission to observe the condition of the walls and gates for himself. Now, the reason why this is secret at night is because there is rising opposition to Nehemiah, which is what we're going to look at next Sunday. Uh, but the result of this secret reconnaissance mission is that he realizes that the report was true. It is as bad as they say. The walls were really in terrible shape and the gates burnt down and the city was in disgrace. Now this shows another trait of a good leader and that is assessing needs. That's what Nehemiah begins to do. He's saying, what's the problem here? What needs to be fixed? And of course, the work of assessing gives way to the work of strategizing. What needs to change? What's the plan? What are the steps? Well, we already saw Nehemiah strategizing last week concerning going to the king, and so it's no surprise that here he has a plan as well to fix the walls and the gates. And so that brings us to this second plan. And really, it's two parts to the second phase. The first phase was to go get the king's favor, and the second phase is this, to motivate and organize God's people. Motivate and organize God's people to do God's work. So let's begin by looking at how he motivated God's people to do God's work. So we see that he already had a plan in mind all the way here in verse 6, 16, excuse me, where we read this. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Nehemiah realizes this project is way too big for just him to do, or even for him and a dedicated group of workers. This would take the whole community of God partnering together to accomplish this great work. Now, my guess is that when we see Nehemiah praying and fasting back in chapter 1 concerning what to do and when to do it and how to do it, I think he was praying for this phase of the plan as well. Of course, he was discerning that he should go to the king, but I think he was also discerning how he should motivate the people and how to organize them as well. Thus, after surveying the damage for himself, Nehemiah calls God's people into action. And we read about that in verses 17 and 18. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come. Come. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. So in this call, Nehemiah does four things. First, he clearly communicates the need, assessing the needs. Here's the need. Here's the problem that needs to be fixed. And that is, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruin. Its gates have been burned with fire. Next, he issues a call for them to act. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. I love how he does this here. He doesn't just command them saying, all right, now you're going to fix it. 
Instead, he invites them to join with him in this rebuilding project. Third, he gives them a vision of the future. He says, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. Jerusalem will once again be a place of honor among the people. And finally, fourth, he encourages them by showing the progress that's already been made. It's kind of like Mike Jones always talking about how we should have the thermometer for to show us how, how, our, how our projects are going. Well, this is, this is Nehemiah showing them, uh, here's the thermometer. We're already done with phase one. I already went to the king and he gave, him me his, he gave me his favor. I got these letters here that say everything's good to do. And, and he gave me, we have as much lumber as we need, all from the king's royal uh, forest. So clearly God's hand was evident in phase one. Should we therefore not expect his hand to be with us in phase two is basically what Nehemiah is trying to tell the people. Again, realize that uh, Nehemiah is not a politician. He's not, uh, he is a manual laborer. He's a common man. Perhaps his time in the king's presence rubbed off on him to be able to speak like this. Or as I think, actually his time in the king's presence and his time in the king of kings' presence have both rubbed off on him and transformed him into a godly leader which the people obviously recognize, given their immediate enthusiastic response. Remember this? I mean, a cupbearer comes in your presence and says, now here's what we're going to do. And the people, you'd think their response would be like, who are you? But instead, their response enthusiastically is, let's, start, let's get going. Let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. And the way it's written, it sounds like it's almost immediate. Let's get to it. What do we got to do? This is the type of response every leader longs for. Just enthusiastic, <laughs> like, yeah, let's do it. This is great. Just putting that out there, all right? All right. They responded so enthusiastically, so immediately, because... Nehemiah gave them a vision of a common longing. There was a pent-up desire on the people's part to see Jerusalem rebuilt and restored, not to be a disgrace and laughingstock anymore. They responded so immediately and so enthusiastically as well because Nehemiah showed them that God's hand was already with them in the work of the king. They responded so immediately and so enthusiastically, thirdly, because Nehemiah showed them how they could make this happen. Now, this is not explicitly stated here in chapter 3, but it's clear in chapter, excuse me, it's not explicitly stated in chapter 2, but it's clear in chapter 3 that Nehemiah has a plan how to make all of this happen. And this brings us to the second part. Remember, first phase, get the king on board, done. Second phase, two parts. Motivate the people, done, they're ready to go. Second part of the second phase, organize them. And it's clear that uh, the people were divided into separate teams and given a portion of the wall, a portion of the gate to rebuild. In fact, chapter 3 begins up here. It's hard to read, so I'll just tell you. It begins here with a sheep gate. And then it moves to the fish gate, Mishnah gate, and it just moves all, chapter 3 just moves all the way to counterclockwise till you get back here to the muster gate, which is next to the sheep gate. So it's organized, and it tells you about each gate, who was responsible for repairing it, how they repaired it, what materials they used, um, and any other data as well. But that is how chapter 3 is laid out. So you can see there's some great organization done by Nehemiah. But how Nehemiah organized them shows the brilliance of his strategic planning, which, of course, is one of the five godly traits that we saw Nehemiah uh, have in the first couple chapters here. So let me give you an example of how brilliant it was. Let's begin with the priest. We're tipped off right from the start, first verse of chapter 3. Eliashib, the high priest and his fellow priests, went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it, set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hanenel. All right, so we're at the first gate right here. This is the sheep gate. Right there, and there's the two towers they're talking about. Uh, this is the north side of the city. And any guesses why you think they called it the Sheep Gate? Allie, why do you think they called it the Sheep Gate? Uh, shepherds and sheep went through it. Yes, 
the sheep went through there, not just the sheep, but a lot of the livestock went through there because this is the gate that is closest to the temple and the altar right there. You can see it. So who do you think is going to use this gate the most? The priest, which is why Nehemiah called the priest to work on this part, this gate and this part of the wall. Uh, because that's the one they were going to be using the most. This is a principle seen throughout the rest of chapter 3. Uh, for example, if the people who were helping were from the surrounding areas and didn't live in Jerusalem, then wherever they were from, whatever direction, that is the part of the wall or the gate that they used. So, for example, if they lived somewhere, let's say they lived in Bethlehem, which is south of Jerusalem. Well, guess what? They would have worked on the Dung Gate or the King's Garden or the Fountain Gate, somewhere around here, because that is the area of the wall and gate that they would use the most. And if you lived in the city, let's say you lived on the east side or you had your business on the east side, well, guess what? You would work on one of the eastern gates or one of the sections of the wall on the eastern side. Wherever the people had uh, the greatest vested interest, whatever area they would most care about due to their own self-interest, that's where Nehemiah wanted them to work. Now, that's not to say that they wouldn't have worked just as hard or just as enthusiastically on another section of the wall or gate. I think they would have for the sake of God and for the sake of their brothers and sisters. But tapping into their own self-interest gave them additional motivation, which they would need in the face of opposition, which we'll look at next Sunday. Well, because of Nehemiah's planning and organizing, in addition to the overwhelming positive response of the people, the work of the wall started quickly and went up quickly. They were, as they say, way ahead of schedule. Now, it's plainly evident that God's hand was with them in all of this. Consider for the fact that Nehemiah is working with a pretty diverse group of people. So if you look through chapter 3, you realize it's not just men doing this work, it's men and women. It's rich and poor and middle class tradesmen. They were coming from diverse regions of Judea. Now listen, a lot of people were working who would not personally benefit from this. It's not like they lived in Jerusalem and therefore they were protecting their homes and business. They lived outside of it. And yet they came to work on the, uh, the wall and gates. Even the leaders were working. The priest, the high priest himself. You can see the high priest being like, oh, my hands are too pure to like, do manual labor. Like, like me. All right, I, my hands are pure. I can't do manual labor. But not Eliashib, the high priest. He participated in the work. In fact, he's the first person named. I think that's pretty cool. Now, it's, uh, and it's not easy to bring together such a diverse group of people. Even if they're all Jewish, it's still, there's lots of different people within the Jewish town of Jerusalem, right? But Nehemiah was able to do it because of their common goals to rebuild their capital. It united them to do this good work. Again, this wasn't forced labor. They did all of this out of a common and shared desire. And it's good to remember, I don't know if you noticed in the passage, but Nehemiah did not receive 100% support. Notice in the last verse we looked at today, chapter 3, verse 5. It says, the next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles, their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Thankfully, this did not stop the people from moving forward. There's always going to be naysayers out there and even friendly opposition. I'm sure these nobles, I mean, they're Jewish, so they're not opposed to this, but they weren't going to do the work themselves. Uh, but this did not cause them to slow down the project one bit. In fact, the common folks of Tekoa took up the burden and did the part that the nobles were supposed to do on their own without the nobles' help and without the nobles' permission either. So what can we take away from our passage today? What application can we draw from Nehemiah 2 and 3? Well, let me suggest three things to close our time together. The first is that God works through all his people. God worked through all his people. We see it here concerning the wall and its gates. You know, God could have done a miracle. He could have had the people walk counterclockwise around the, these broken down walls and gates seven times. 
and then mirac and then blown a trumpet and miraculously the walls and gates come up. It'd be like the reverse of the Jericho. You walk seven times, blow the trumpet, and the walls came tumbling down. But that is not what God does. Instead, God raised up Nehemiah and put it in the heart of him and the heart of the king and the heart of the people to do the work. And if you're a parent or if you've been a parent, you realize there's a big, big difference between giving something to someone and having them work to earn it. And God knows that as well. So it took all the people working together to get the job done. Now, friends, we have a work to do here as well. God has called us to do some great things in our church and in our community. So no matter your age, your background, your social class, if you are a Christian, you have been given gifts and abilities to contribute towards that work. Second, God uses leaders to motivate and organize his people to do his work. God uses leaders to motivate and organize his people to do his work. I mean, this is clearly seen in Nehemiah. God placed his hand on him, and even though he wasn't royalty, he wasn't a priest, he wasn't a prophet, nonetheless, because he was emotionally in sync with God, a man of prayerful action and biblical awareness, filled with a humble confidence and strategy, God called him and gave him a vision, and the people clearly recognized his leadership and joyfully submitted to that leadership. Friends, I call this, this is an important reason why you should be praying for your leaders praying for me, praying for the deacons and trustees. Realize that vision comes from God first and foremost. We can't just, we can try to come up with things on our own, but if it's not from God, it's not going to go anywhere. You see, because God, I believe, real, still today uses leaders to motivate and organize his people to do his work. And that's a good reason to be praying for us. And finally, third, ultimately God's work is for God's glory alone. God's work is for God's glory alone. The question to ask is, why did almost everybody contribute their time and energy to do this work? Because we, we understand if you're living in the city, why you would do it. I mean, it protects your homes, it protects your businesses and families. But what about all these people who helped, and there were a lot of them, but lived outside the city, perhaps some distance away? Well, the main reason they did this was because Jerusalem was where their God had placed his name and his glory. The temple of God was the center of an ancient Jew's life. That was where God chose to be present among his people in the Holy of Holies, inside the temple at the highest spot in Jerusalem. Thus, for the glory of God, they worked to rebuild the city of God. Now, friends, God no longer dwells primarily in a single temple among his people. Rather, he chooses to dwell in his people, making all of them living, walking, and talking temples where God desires to display his presence and glory to a watching world. Let me close with this quote from, that I read in one of my commentaries this week, which I think uh, sums all this up very well. Uh, James Hamilton writes this in his book, Christ-Centered Exposition on the Book of Nehemiah. Today, God's name is no longer at stake in a city with walls and gates. God's name is now at stake in the lives of his people, who are the new temple of the Holy Spirit. What walls and gates need work in your life? Is it your marriage? Is it your children? Does your eye gate, eye gate need attention? Maybe you recognize that just as Jerusalem lay in ruins with gates burned in Nehemiah's day, so your life is in ruins today. Your gates are burned down and you are helpless to put the flames out that are destroying you. The message you need to hear is that there is a greater leader than Nehemiah who can deliver you from all the danger facing you. There is one who is more zealous for God's name to be hallowed, for God's kingdom to come, and for God's will to be done. That zeal led Jesus to give his life so that all who trust in him will be saved. Let us as well call on our greater leader, Jesus Christ, as we seek to do his work together here at Somerset Congregational Church for the glory of God alone in 2021. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we call on you. We seek you. We realize that no matter how zealous we are for you, Jesus, you are more zealous for, for God, for his kingdom, for his will, for his glory. 
Father, we pray that you would give us a vision. Father, we thank you've given us a word. We know what to do. We know what we're given. But how to do that, when to do that, what that looks like specifically, Father, that needs to come from you. So I pray that you would give me and the leaders here and your people here a vision of where you are taking us, what you would have us to do in the coming year and years. Father, we thank you that uh, just as you put it in the heart of Nehemiah and the people to rebuild, Father, that you are doing that in our hearts till today. Not necessarily to rebuild gates and walls, but to produce in us uh, the glory that is do your name, that we might live for you, we, we might display the fruits of your spirit in us and through us as individuals and as your people here at Somerset Congregational Church. Father, we ask for your help and blessing, especially as we come to our meeting today. Be with us, fill us, guide us, direct us by your Holy Spirit. We pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is a call to action. We saw Nehemiah give the people a call to action, and so this hymn is also a call. It is, Come all Christians, be committed. It's 455 in your hymnals. Come all Christians, be committed. Please stand if you're able. 455.